And good morning, hello, good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 348. I am your host, Lauren Gray, and today's topic is marketing for HR, the new job. At least that's my coin phrase for it. Um, I have been finding it remarkable uh, these past couple of weeks in my dialogues with many clients and also people that are asking or making scheduling rooms, which is a pleasure to actually say that I'm scheduling for speaking engagements again after a two-year hi- hiatus for obvious reasons. Um, matter of fact, my last personal, uh, my last business trip was just now was two years ago, uh, almost to the day, March of 2020 was uh, the last time I went, I think went to Navis, I was speaking at their conference. And then this year was the next one, which I was able to go to one of my clients in Indianapolis and speak to uh, their hotel group that I work with. Um, and they out there somewhere. It was kind of fun. It was really very, very enjoyable. Um, and it was kind of a mixture of very familiar, because I did travel a lot, to, well, that's different, which is just out of the uh, evolution of things in this past couple of years. But one thing that had been a conversation many times over, not only with the clients directly, but with people as I talk about subject matter content that they want to deal with uh, at the conferences they're asking me to speak to, and that is HR. Um, we, of course, go uh, ebb and flow with our focus on HR, and uh, the people that really constantly are aware of it are the people that have to deal with the shortages of that at our property levels, the people that we just don't have where we used to have them before. Um, the double and triple tasking of our current team members and the balancing act associated with not burning out the people that are still with us as our team, our dedicated team. Um, And also the desire to find new team members with us. Uh, I noted that in the conference that I was able to attend, the summit that I was able to attend in Indianapolis, there was a lot of recognition justifiably to a lot of their team members who had gone above and beyond uh, this company, Shocket, actually, I don't mind sharing, sharing their name, was very special in my mind for the fact that their corporate officers went into the trenches as soon as it was necessary. It wasn't a matter of us, them mentality, which I see so often in other organizations for hospitality, uh, where their corporate office was, we do corporate, we don't do property. These guys roll up the sleeves. All of them uh, were skilled from the property level up. So they they rose in the ranks to the corporate level. So going back to the property, uh, was very familiar to them because that's where they came from. So they pulled the night auditing shifts. They pulled the night shifts. They pulled the housekeeping shifts. They pulled the engineering shifts. They did the food service shifts and what have you because they needed to. There was, uh, as we know, for the past couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of flux, not only in the demand cycle, but also in the availability of resources to handle that demand. Summer last year was the prime example of it being inverse, massive amount of demand and tremendously shorthanded when it came to providing service levels. And our service scores reflected that. Um, but for the most part, they were in the trenches. And so this focus on uh, hospitality staffing has been very much highlighted at moments and then forgotten at others. And I think right now it's back into the lull of I have other things to worry about or it's not going to change tomorrow. I have other things I have to deal with, but it is still an ever present problem. I'd like to break apart that problem today a little bit and work on more specifics as to what exactly a property could and should do about helping itself in finding the team members that it needs to be more successful, not only in the service scores overall, but actually in the ability to rebalance the workloads of its team members. Um, To do this, we have to go back a little bit into the history of HR. Uh, we've had this discussion on the show a couple of times in various contexts, but today is about marketing it, uh, marketing and HR combining together, which are two things you would never think would be in the same sentence. And I'm going to, here to explain a little bit today as to why they should be in the same sentence. The history of HR, first off, the misnomer that human resources is for the benefit of the team members is not exactly true because the team members do not directly pay the HR person. They're not a representative like a union rep is or something like this. This person is a role that is payrolled by the company that has them hired. The HR director is pretty much there to make sure that everyone goes between the bumpers. The guidelines are followed, the rules are followed, the protocols are followed for a variety of reasons, most often leaning towards the benefit of the company that they're working for. Were we in legal compliance? Did we do all that we're supposed to do legally so that we don't put ourselves into jeopardy? Did we follow the proper processes when it came to our team members? Uh, if there was issues in disciplinary actions, did we 
do the things in a way that we outlined we to the team member when they first came on board so that we didn't violate our own policies that would put us into legal hot water or expose us to liabilities for not having done it properly. That is a key element of HR for anyone and always will be. That never goes away. That is a very primal core aspect of HR. HR is also usually tasked with the aggregation and aspect of who does what where based on what is being asked and for roles. They are the ones that are supposed to go fetch. I need a houseman. I need a housekeeper. I need a front desk. I need a uh, night out. I need a restaurant server. I need a restaurant chef. The HR person is a key component in the chain of discovery for those positions. This is where we start getting into a change of roles. Historically, back before we had what we had, our industry, and I've whined about this many times, was based on a merit system. You had to pay your dues to advance. You had to show dedication and commitment. You usually had the terrible shifts, the low pay, the, the, the inability to really negotiate your schedule as a matter of complete demand, especially for food and beverage, which is what I came up through, where every holiday was a work day because every holiday had events that you were doing. If it wasn't for catering and banquets, it was because the restaurant had featured events. So the idea that you had to go through this trial of fire and, and after a period of time, you will recognize that, yes, you're one of the dedicated ones. You're in here. You're, you're a foodie or you're a hotelier. Or you're, you're into this. You know, you love this. And yes, there's a lot of reasons why you love this stuff. Uh, the satisfaction of guest satisfaction, the satisfaction of making an experience for a guest. It all drives that, that adrenaline rush that you have for doing this. But we paid terrible and we didn't reward early. Uh, benefits usually came after a duration of time. And if so, they were menial. Um, you worked up through levels of roles. You went in from, from labored positions into skilled positions. That's not a derogatory statement to labored positions. Skilled positions required education at different components to be able to do them, like supervisory roles and or leadership roles that required you to operate over several other things. And that's the only reason the designation exists for that. Um, and through that merit, you always had the ability to empathetically reflect upon the people that you were now responsible for because you were them before you were you. And that was usually the train of how our staffing went. Um, we The skill sets that we were looking for for people were uh, outgoing, people-oriented, uh, sensitive and empathetic to, to satisfaction of the guest. Um, now, we had our own designations between front of the house and back of the house. Front of the house was more so necessary to have these kind of skills. Back of the house, less necessary, but they were still an integral part. An engineer, regardless of how much they're not so much front of the house, still had guest interaction. They still had to come up to a guest room to fix an issue that they were having and or saw a guest in the hallway. So we learned the 1020 rule. We learned all these things about how to interact with our guests since that was our, our main service is hospitality is service, heart of the servant. Well, we went through that until we didn't get to go through that. COVID hit and uh, our industry unceremoniously furloughed a lot of people everywhere. Whether you did it right or you did it wrong, you reduced what you had. Um, having lived through 9-11, I can say when I was running hotels down the Keys, the first cuts are the easiest. Those were the people that were on the moderate fence anyway. They were there hoping they got better. They were just brought in. They haven't been able to show themselves or prove themselves, or we were already a little heavy in that department thinking we're going to lose somebody. So those were the easy cuts when it came to reducing our labor costs, which is one of the largest nuts that any business has, regardless of being hospitality. Um, then the next cuts were a little harder because now we're getting rid of people that were doing a good job, but they were the least needed out of the people that were also doing a good job. So the second cut was a little harder. The third cut started getting really painful because now we're letting people go that have no reason to be let go other than we can't afford to maintain their relationship with us because we don't have enough business to maintain payroll. These cuts were a little harder because that now put extra burden on the people that we didn't cut because they had to fill the gap of those people. They were essential in the sense that had business been normal, they would have been critical to be with us. But because business wasn't normal, they were uh, necessary to remove from our expenses. The fourth cut, made you cry because the fourth cut you're letting go your core people these are the people that are that sweated the color of your hotel in that sense you know green for holiday inn or blue for hilton red for Marriott, whatever whatever analogy you want to have for these people were loyal they were incredibly hard working they had already assumed the responsibility of the people that you had had to let go before them they mantled it well they did all that they could and they did not deserve the fact that they were not being continued on simply because you didn't have the finances to do so 
And the fifth is actually the hardest, which means you actually are closing the business. At that point, you're on life support. You're on uh, keep it, keep the air conditioners on in the closed wing so the mold doesn't grow up because you're not selling your rooms over there and you can't send housekeeping over because you don't have anybody housekeeping. That process is very first person familiar to me. Um, and the rebuilding from that and bringing team members back, you want the people that you let go to come back because first off, you, you feel uh, that you owe it to them. And secondly, they're already skilled and trained for what you already do. The issue that happened for us here in COVID is that a lot of people, once they were let go, found other ways to find income because they, they, they couldn't know when they're going to get their business back. There was no way to know whether they get the job back, I should say. And so they had to find other means of income. They lost their job. They got to find another job. Their skills that we taught them and trained them, the very reasons we hired them were assets to them to find other jobs, whether it be in retail, whether it be in any other industry that requires those people skills. We were a fount of resource for those those businesses. Uh, a lot of companies like Amazon, it was touted in the news quite regularly. Uh, they were offering great hourlies and full benefits when you kicked in. And yes, it's putting square pegs in square holes, square pegs in square holes. And yes, they're looked at as being very arduous to work for because every second is accounted for and so forth. But it fulfilled the base of what was needed, which was a steady, strong income and benefits that would cover for anything that would be happening to you incidentally because of medical, which has been a huge focus for these past couple of years, especially. So a lot of people went that way. And what they ended up finding was, not only was it not as bad as they thought it was potentially, but two, they moved up well because they had the skills from, from having been in hospitality. And three, they also found other opportunities to step into. Once they broke that mold from being with us in hospitality into something else, that gave them other perspectives of what else they could do and what else they could do. And they eventually traveled off into a different path career-wise for themselves. Um, that left us where we wanted to get the people back when we started getting business. Well, they, a lot of them weren't going to come back. Also, a lot of people, because of how our industry ran itself, where it was all a merit system, work until you prove worthy, um, a lot of people realized that that was a hamster wheel they didn't want to get back on. And so as much as they were very good at doing what they did with us in hospitality, they chose not to go back to that hamster wheel again and decided to continue their path down something else. So we were left with a gap. Not only could we not bring back the people that we had let go, we couldn't even find other people that weren't exposed to our industry because our industry didn't exactly have a stellar rating as to, oh, golly, first thing I want to do is work for hospitality for less money, no benefits and hard work. When I can go over here and make more money, all benefits and controlled work. You see the problem we had for the past two years. And I know I'm calling the kettle black. We all have understand this perspective of what our problem for an industry has been for the past two years. So take now HR into that discussion. HR historically, as I mentioned, is the gatekeeper between the bumpers. They make sure that we follow the guidelines both for both of us. Their focus is obviously corporate centric to make sure that we maintain all the policies that we say and the guidelines and the legalities that we need to. But they were always the ones that when uh, the chef needed a kitchen staff member, maybe it's a line cook, maybe it was a prep cook, maybe it was whatever. The process was they knew what they needed. Okay. They knew what they could offer. They knew that it was this many hours, these many shifts, this, what have you. They would then go into the HR person and say, I'm short this person. Now, obviously, the general manager had to be involved. Like, do we have budget for this salary? Yes, we do. But they're, 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 this is a role that we had budgeted for. This is how much we can spend. So now we know what our rate of pay is for this position. Great. And uh, they asked the chef, chef, what is it you're looking for? Well, I need this much experience, this much education, uh, this much history, blah, blah, blah. HR would then take that and then evaluate it into the scope of where they think they could find these people. Obviously, being a line in person, a line per employee to the hotel, it's not like you're going to hire somebody from the other side of the country to come over. They might have moved over here from the other side of the country, but they're still local. Those positions are locally based. That means they have to get the word out locally that this position is available. First round of this is going to all current team members. Do you know somebody that you think would be good in this role? The second is also internally team members. If it's an elevated position compared to somebody else, is somebody worthy of being considered to be moved up? And we have to replace their role, not the one we first have as a gap. That's usually done by internal solicitations, like we have this role open. If you're interested in this, and if an internal candidate does come up, then we have to evaluate them according to the criteria that we had to establish for that position. This is where we go into the mechanics or logistics of HR. There are three major components of any position. The actual legalities of saying what you need, because those are what are held when, if they're in violation, 
the person violates them and they're terminated and they come back saying, why did you terminate me? You can point to the rule that says you need to be able to carry 50 pounds and be on your feet for six hours. You don't have that ability. You have X and you didn't tell us about that. And you can't perform the job role that was defined by these rules. And therefore we can't keep you in the role because you can't do the responsibility that this role is. That's a legality. That's a requirement. That section is something that has to be defined if you need this. Then you have what's considered the qualifications section, which is what you feel the candidate should have. Now, there's still some legality to it in the sense that it can't be an outlandish perspective, must have a PhD in uh, biblical philosophy, okay, unless truly you can justify that. Um, it has to be relevant to the position. You don't want it to be too exacerbating where it's like, no, I need five years experience. You have four and a half. Sorry, you can't do that. Which uh, some of the, our, our things in time we used to do like that. I'm sorry, you know, you're missing this piece and you can't do that. I know many companies used to hire based on college degree only. If you didn't have a, a BA, you weren't brought in. And it was not something that was ever flexed based on the qualifications of the individual person. It was just based on as a threshold for those roles. And it was the dumbest thing I ever thought in the world. But anyway, so you have the parameters of expectations of what they, the, the role should have to qualify you to do good in this job. And then you have the third part, which is the role itself. This is the part that is definitively missing in most dialogue for people in HR. They get down the job description role, you know, must carry 50 pounds, be on your feet for six hours, so forth and so on, be able to work X number of shifts, da, 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 da. And the, you know, what we're willing to compensate, you know, this is your hourly rate you're going to get for this. This is when you can receive benefits, which is just generalized. But oftentimes they don't even refer to them. They just say that we offer packages, but then you have to get to be the candidate to understand what those packages are. We just don't broadcast that. That's historically what it's been. And so this, this job description has been usually regulated to factual. Our housemen are responsible for carrying up and loading home, uh, laundry and supplying the, uh, the housekeeping staff in the rooms for any of supply services that are needed and are also the functional removal of things that are from the room to be brought down for laundry services, da, da, da. That's a job description. That's function of what the job does. Okay. That's what we've usually done. And now HR will take that and first, like I said, they'll internally see if anybody's looking for the position, move up in the position, know of anybody that wants to go in the position. They post on the bulletin board in the common areas for the team in the back of the house. Then they might go over and there might be historically had been maybe some job fairs and or places to jo post jobs at or go to the local uh, uh, community job source resources, places that were looking for people to find local jobs that go in and say, OK, we need a, a construction person here or a plumbing person over here. Those places and say, hey, I have these roles open. If you have anybody who wants to get in food service, this is the role we have. Uh, more robustly back in the day, uh, depending upon you on your hotel, if you had an independent website and you had career page on it, you might post the job availability there. But 99.999% of all of those things that were put up there were just the two components I have mentioned so far, job identification and description. That was it. We have this role. It is a houseman. Um, it does this and it's full time. Contact us if you want to know more. So now bringing it to our current time frame, we have the issue that everybody needs everybody. Every hotel needs somebody, every restaurant especially needs somebody. There's a huge need for staff. If everybody, and they have been doing exactly the same thing, I have a server position available, full-time, inquire within. Great. Why do I want it? The biggest question that doesn't get answered by HR is why? Why should I consider you over somebody else is offering the same thing? Why should I be interested in you versus interested in them? What do you have that I want? See, the market isn't about us having what everybody wants and we can, what I call the Disney method. I don't like you, get out of line. I want the person behind you. We don't have that luxury right now. The role has reversed. Instead, there's all of us wanting one of them. And they're asking us, what makes you better than them? What is it that you're offering that I want compared to what they're offering and what I may want from them? We're not doing that. And it's easy to blame HR saying, well, well HR, that's their job, human resources. It's in the title. They should be doing this. 
that's a lot like not going all biblical. It's like when they uh, when the Pharaoh told the, the Israelis uh, Israelites uh, to make bricks without straw. It's like not going to really work well. Um, the idea is that HR is a function of the company. There's only two departments. Third, if you include the GM, but there's only two departments that touch every department within a hotel. One is accounting, the other one is HR. Accounting is functional and easy, and it has its own merit of being included in conversations. HR is not often included in conversations. It's kind of like the policeman being invited to the party. You're a little less likely to drink heavy if you know that the policeman's looking at you going, mm, I'm gonna watch if you're driving away. The idea is that HR tends to always make sure that things are being done in a way that doesn't jeopardize the company. Remember, the company is the key element of the HR relationship. So the HR person usually isn't in the dialogue associated with what really they need to know to be better at finding you the right candidate. There's two breakdowns to any HR conversation about a position that needs to be filled. One is the accuracy and legitimacy of what's being requested for the role. And the other is the ability to convey the role's value to the best candidate. These are two broken down pieces that do not exist in current HR relationships. And I'm being general when I say that, but I will say 99.999% of all hospitality HR has not changed to rise up to the need of what it needs to do currently. And that is why you see persistently shortages in HR um, positions to be filled. People will need the roles to be, restaurants roles to be at hotels and so forth. Having owned restaurants and run restaurants before, I'll say that, that back in the day when there was always somebody coming in and applying, I was the most casual interviewer that you could find. Hi, sit down. Oh, hi, nice to meet you. Hi, I'm doing, my name's Lauren. Da -da, I own the place. Uh, great, great. Uh, I see that you're looking for service. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's flexible schedule. It's full time, so around 35 hours, which I always try to keep below because it, there was thresholds about full time versus not full time, which made difference as to what you had to offer and so forth. Just saying. And when you had to pay overtime, even though anyway. There's rules and guidelines that meant that that have loopholes. If you can keep them below certain levels, you didn't have to worry about certain responsibilities financially. It was a business model. And because it was a resource of people wanting to always get a job, it was a matter of just whether or not you were willing to tolerate what they didn't know long enough for them to learn it. And you would pay them enough to keep them around for what you needed. It's calloused, but it was true. And my casual interviews were pretty much, so what brought you here? How far away do you live? Is it easy for you to get here? Do you have to drive? Do you have to walk? Uh, what kind of a flexibility of schedule do you have? Have you ever done this before? Where have you done this before? How did you? How well did you do it before? Um, let me see you carry a tray. Let me see you carry some plates. Let me see you carry multiple glasses. Whatever I needed is the criteria for the, the flavor brand of restaurant that I had at the time were my questions associated with them. I didn't sell them anything. They came in already bought. If I offered them a job, they would take it. I didn't have to sell them on the job. They were already coming in for the job. I didn't have to say, well, who else have you interviewed with? And who am I competing with? And who am I being compared to? Didn't exist in my conversation interviewing them. It was about, I already had them. I just had to decide if I wanted them. That world has changed for us. As restaurateurs, as hoteliers, we don't have that luxury. On any level, line position, skill position, management position, no level do we have pick and choose capabilities anymore. We may get multiple candidates but doesn't mean that we have the choice of those multiple candidates. We have to sell ourselves to them. And that is where we get back to the topic that we were talking about today. And that is marketing in combination with HR. But here's the thing with HR, they're not marketers. They can be creative, they can be cute. They have great little, you know, when they do the, the message boards and they put all the cute little cardboard cutouts around it and stuff, and they have the birthday parties and the, the, uh, the team uh, building parties and so forth. They're really creative about that. And they very much, there's some really genuinely amazing HR directors. So please don't think I'm bashing the position that are warm. They're engaged with their team members. They listen to their team members. They're supportive of their team members. They collaborate with the team members. They help their team members. There is wonderful examples in our industry of HR people. But let's be clear about restaurants in comparison to hoteliers. They usually don't have an HR person. 
That's usually just the manager. And it's usually just the general manager. And the assistant managers are really just conduits to the general manager. And they might have a consensus of who they want to hire based on the applicants that are coming in. That's HR, okay? And the world of, did they fill out the forms, their I-9, their W-4s, and what have you? Is all this cleared up? Has it been put on payroll? Usually it's a third-party payroll that handles it. So you you feed the forms to the, the candidates that's being hired. You may go through a background check, which is always smart. Never nothing you should ever skip. Go through that process. Everything fits the qualifications. Boom, they're done. They got their, their payroll set up, and they're ready to go over and get on the clock. And there it is. Now it's a training thing consideration. And fitting them into the schedule that you intended to put them in. And it's usually on the low end of the schedule compared to everybody else that's been with you for a while. They get the crappy stuff, the crappy stations, crappy hours, uh, all that kind of stuff. And if they stay around long enough, then they move up into the ranks that they're now the person that's always been there. So when somebody new comes in, they don't have to do the crappy stuff. The new guy gets to do the new girl gets to do the crappy stuff. Sound familiar? That's what we do. We do it in hotels as well. Do you think that the new front desk person is going to get the best shifts at front desk? No. They're going to get the ones that were missing that were on the bottom end and the ones that have been there for a while, they're rewarded for being there for a while. They get the preferred schedule. They don't work weekends as much as they used to. They don't work nights as much as they used to. They don't work holidays as much as they used to. You know who does that? The new person. This is killing us. This is killing our ability to bring decent people into our industry and be rewarded for that decision. First off, they are having to get past all the hurdles we're throwing up about not selling them as to why they want to with us. We're just simply saying, we need people. Pick and choose from any of us. And that's what they're doing. They're saying, well, let me see what's in my area. I live here, X, Y, Z. Let me look around and see who's here. So where do they find jobs? Where do the people looking for a, a, a position go? Is there a definitive uh, hospitality job location? There's ones that want to be. There's ones that tout that they are. Usually, yes, if they're well-known, not if they're not. Uh, there's a lot of very large places that try to help job people find job positions. Uh, you know, the zip recruiters and the Indeeds and all this that are touting how much they help the process of connecting people that are looking for roles to the places that are looking for those roles to be filled. But the reality is they're form-fitted functional platforms that are a conduit, but not a creative. They're a, they're a means, but not a mode. They're not selling your place unless you sell your place on them. And that's a key component to the discussion. What are you doing to sell why people should choose the offer opportunities that you have for roles compared to anybody else that they might be comparing against you? And you may not know who they are. You don't know how diverse their job search is. They might just as equally work at your hotel as a houseman as it is being a bus or server at a restaurant, as it might be as a clerk at a, at a convenience store, as it might be on a construction site. You do not know what they're considering, but you do have one thing you can control, and that is how do you perceive yourself and represent that in your uh, ability to say why, that big question again, why do they want to work with you? Why do they want to become a part of your team? And that's the marketing that has to be infused into HR. And we're asking HR to do something they've never had to do before. And they've never had it as a qualification of their position. So let's go back through the process of how we can improve upon what I've already pointed out in a half hour's worth of time of what's wrong. Let me spend extra time now to talk about how to fix what we need in a way that works better. First off, the person that's in charge of the role that's trying to be filled, and in this case, the example I've been giving is a, is a line cook in a restaurant and a hotel, the chef and food and beverage director have to concur on what is the qualifications necessary for that position to be filled. You don't want uh, a Boy Scout has never worked a fire later to work a fire later in a heavy crunch time period. Danger is this danger will Robinson. Somebody's going to get hurt because they don't know about all the things they should know to handle a fire good. So you need to know that there has to be an experience level. For this position, we need experience as a line cook in relationship to the equipment they're going to be using. That's a given. Chunk, chunk, right there. Also, all of the requirements that the company needs to qualify a person physically capable of doing the role, which is one of the three block and tackle things that we talked about before, has to be in there. Chunk, chunk, okay? Carry 50 pounds, be on your feet for six hours plus, that kind of stuff that, you know, as much as you want to be diverse in your hiring, some roles require physicality and ability to do the role safely. 
and is th th this would be one of them. Okay, must be able to be on their feet and handle things like this and do these things and so forth and so on. They're defined and outlined. Nothing too different than what I've been talking about so far. Here's where we begin to venture off. The requested guidelines. Well, I'd love it for them to have a couple years uh, experience. Is two really important? Or is one okay? Is three too much? How much quantifiably is experience in your mind? Have they ever done it versus having done it a lot? What is the real justification of that meter going to the left or to the right? That's a key element of defining really threshold entry opportunity versus high qualification requirement. That has to be truly vetted between, at this point, the chef and the food and beverage director. Realizing that not everybody could qualify for the high end, must have five years of Ruth Chris Morgan Steakhouse capability cooking of steaks for our steak person on the line cook. If that's what you truly want, truly need, and truly think is critical and nothing else less would qualify, so be it. Most of the time, idealism of what you would prefer versus what you're willing to settle for goes on to how good of a trainer are you and how much infrastructure and training you have so that the person, even though they may be shortening in their, their experience qualification, can quickly go through the learning curve to be at the level of performance that you want that role to be. That has a lot to do with it. If you don't have that kind of modality, time of training capability or training resources for that, that has to be factored into your threshold of requirements so that you're not bringing in somebody that you don't have the time to train, but need them to do better than what they have done and only fail and create twice as much work for you to repair what they broke plus replace what they didn't. That's a reality. So once you develop what that threshold is, it's really, a you begin to realize it's a band. This is the minimum that we feel is qualifiable for the role. And this is just, wow, that would be manna from heaven if we got that. Um, that's the range. So the lowest end is to, under the qualifier are willing to, and here would prefer to, literally the verbiage, okay? Now the third part to the role that the food and beverage director and the, uh, the chef have to do is to give HR some direct aspects of personality, um, things that are intangibles. Because there is a culture that exists in every business environment. And the culture is based on the team members that are in that business environment. If it is a factual thousand miles an hour pedal to the metal through the floor, if you can, all holes barred, just add it. And this is a restaurant I'm talking about where you open the door, it's bang, 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 chits everywhere. It's literally tables are full. Business is now. If you weren't prepped and set by the time that happened, you were nothing but buried and miserable. If that's the environment, then you need somebody that has the mental capability, the perspective of lean in, get it done. You're slapping and throwing and grilling and tossing. If you're not that and you have... We have a lot of prep. We do a lot of banquets. We have a lot of lead time. We have the ability to really organize ourselves, do proper co coordination of rotation of inventory because we have time and opportunities to build huge tables full of, you know, 100, 150 of the same plates kind of stuff. And you need somebody that is organized, mentally acute, patterned in process, methodical, detail oriented, totally different spectrum of demand. It's not that you don't want somebody to be detail oriented and slapping food out on a plate. But the level of team is very different. That needs to be explained to the HR person. They don't work in your kitchen. They've walked through your kitchen. They know who works in your kitchen. And they may have gotten food out of your kitchen. They may have even helped you in the kitchen running food or you know, plating up stuff or whatever you know, as extra team members work. But they don't know the culture of your kitchen. So that has to be shared with the HR person. Because the main element that the food and beverage director and the chef have to realize in replacing this position we're making up fictitiously on a discussion is they are handing this over to HR. Because from that moment forward, their perspective of availability of people, candidates for that role is solely based on the success of HR finding the people that fit the mold that they've been asked to chase from the food and beverage director and the chef. So the more you can share on a scale of forced ranking preferences. We absolutely need this. Would love to have this. This would be great. Okay for that. We'll possibly deal with this. 
anything below this just doesn't fit. That helps HR, believe it, to understand what it is in range that they can do. Now, it's in HR's hands. They've done their job. They've outlined it. They've detailed it. HR has now posted it locally, internally. Nobody internally is looking for it. Nobody internally knows anybody. Okay, I got to get this out in front of people. Being a line position, it's going to be local. People have to be near the hotel or hotel's restaurant or just restaurant to be able to do this job. It's not like they we're not going to fly somebody in, as I mentioned before. So we got to bring this out locally. Well, three options. We already discussed two of them. One is to go out to the local job boards, job fairs, and see if there's anything that we can post with them that they can share with the people that are going into their, those locations looking for a position. Second is that they go and broad broadcast it on platforms that are job placement platforms. And to be fair to HR, they should know what job placement platforms in their market are most often used based on the history of who they get applicants from. If Indeed is the place or Zip Recruiter is the place or one of thousands of job placement platforms, uh, there might be some that are very local centric and capable. There's some that might be uh, have been used repetitively and are very functional or they might not be. But the HR person is should be aware of what those options are for them. So then they have to post the information up on these platforms. The platforms have data fields. So you're supposed to put in the information that they need to post the position you're asking for on their platform. It's a standard formatting thing. Name of the position, description of the position, what's about the position, requirements of the position, who do they contact for the position? Where is this position being offered from? Basic fundamental stuff. You'll notice right now when I say that, I don't say that with a lot of enthusiasm because it's not selling anything about you. It's broadcasting. This is who I am. This is what I want. This is what we need. This is how you contact me. That's what it does. That doesn't make you different than somebody else in your market looking for the same position that they might need. It doesn't tell people that are looking for a position why they should choose you compared to why they would choose them. Now, you're relying on the fact that by them showing interest and you reciprocating that interest and you call for an interview, that that's the time you get to do all the, the, the dog and pony stuff. Like, woo, hey, so thanks for giving me in. Well, what are you looking for, blah, blah, blah. This is where it falls down. Again, HR is not the immediate supervisor that they would be dealing with. Those people are not going to talk to the immediate supervisor they would be dealing with until they get past HR. HR is there to see if the person that says they qualify based on what they shared truly qualifies. They're there for vetting validation. That's HR's role at that moment is they're just ensuring that that candidate is what they said they are for what we said we needed. There's no sale pitch to this at all. This is functional qualification. If it passes that gateway saying, yes, they fulfilled that, then they're going to go over and tell the food and beverage director and the chef, I have a candidate for you. Great. Now they're going to go through an interview, let's say. Okay. This is where the food and beverage director or the chef will be first person interview. Sometimes the food and beverage director demands that they do all the own, their only interviews and that if they really like them, then they're going to allow the chef to do it. Sometimes the food and beverage director is like, hey, it's going to be your person. You interview them. And then if you like them, I'll go for and look at and interview them and do the final. So it can go either way, but usually not just one person because it has to be confirmed. So say, for instance, they talk to the chef first and the chef feels that they're qualified. The chef defers when the person is asking about compensation, packages, benefits, guidelines, whatever. HR will tell you that. And they usually won't really tell you that until it's up to a point of whether they're going to offer you the role. They don't share that openly with, oh, well, we offer a very competitive benefit package that includes this, this, and this. They're very vague about it, even if they mention it, but they're not very specific about it until they offer you the role. So they still haven't sold you on the idea of why they want to be with you compared to somebody else that's offering the same position because it sounds very similar to what the other position is also doing. They're going through the same process. They go on interview, same thing. So say the chef feels that they're qualified and that's fine. They've deflected any really in-depth thing about this. They've shared a little bit about their ethos of running a kitchen and what they're looking for in a kitchen. Not a whole lot, but really it's just I'm telling you what I want, not really anything else other than that. And then if the person is still around, if they haven't, gone someplace else at this point, and, and it's agreed that the, the chef likes them, HR has already vetted them, then the food and beverage director, if they or they don't want to, will go over and do the other last interview, which is the conclusion of the perception. He agrees, she agrees that this person would fit, 
and says, we're going to offer the position to you. And that goes back to HR. And HR goes over and says, yes, you've qualified. We're great. This is what we can offer you. This is what usually happens. Unless you walk on water, you're not going to get the top end of what you were offered back in the day. It was usually some sort of carrot on a stick. We're going to start you here. After 90 days, if you prove yourself, even though you've gone through all this up to this point, once you prove yourself, we'll bump you back up to this level or we'll bump you up to this level as a 90-day review. At the 90 days, should you still be here and we give you this bump and we reviewed in your positive performance, then you will be eligible for the following benefits. That goes back to HR. HR tells them all that. So that is usually historically what has been the interview application or application interview and offer process. That's why we're not getting people because we're not talking about the elements that now make a difference for so many people looking for roles. Pretty much everybody's throwing money out there. Pretty much everybody's increasing, uh, especially line level position, hourly rates. I'll give you 15, 16, 17, 18, $20 an hour. I need people now, 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 now. Knowing they're going to be jumping into a fast moving river because obviously if they say yes, they're going to be doing a lot of work very quickly because they're in high demand. They don't talk about the fact that they will be eligible for overtime because obviously the organization is going to try to mitigate how much overtime that they would be offering because it's very expensive monies. They've increased the hourlies, plus now overtime at time and a half makes it even more expensive. Benefits and so forth, the cost of those have gone up dramatically. The cost of third-party payroll has gone up dramatically. Um, it's very expensive to bring somebody on board. You have all your workman's compensation, your FICAs, everything else that you have to pay for an employee. So with salary or, or hourly to the hours is really almost doubled when you're talking about an employee because of all the extra costs that go along with getting a new full-time employee. But the the part that has to change for us now is two hotels side by side, both looking for the same position, both offering the same income, both offering the same hours, both offering the same benefits, mirrors of each other, right? So what is a candidate's choice going to be? It goes to the things that are important now for a lot of candidates coming into our market. It's quality of life. I'm not talking about the Zen happy tree hugging concept of, oh, we used to do 50-50. It's not that. People are very happy to enjoy their work, but it is still work and they need their balance of time. How soon do you give me benefits? How much do you reward me for performance? What is the culture that I'm enjoying? Am I working for an a-hole or am I dealing with somebody that cares about the fact that I'm able to have problems and issues like anybody else, but are willing to work with me on those and also are supportive of my efforts? Am I am I striving for a, a career where this is a stepping stone to another role? Is that being offered in this organization? Is there opportunity for me to grow? Is there opportunity for me to to expand into new, new roles and shift you know, departments eventually and so forth? Am I giving greater opportunity by joining you than by joining somebody else? What is the feel? Am I joining a team that likes working together? Am I joining a team that helps each other? Uh, am I joining a team that will invest in me in training and time and patience and not just I walk in the door and they say, throw in the uniform, follow me. I need you to show you where you dump the first load of laundry and there's no happy how handshake and what have you. It's about jump in here and start picking up a, a shovel. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. Nobody wants to be there's so many missing elements to that conversation of what should be done, could be done. I can only refer back to the ways uh, I was brought into the industry and the ways I learned from that to be in the industry. Um, what we did was we tried to coordinate several key elements of onboarding that added to the value of those that were getting onboarded. First off, whether we hired a housekeeper or whether we hired a executive level uh, person, they went through the same orientation. Every time I would hire a new team member, I would actually say, would you please be so kind as to come into the hotel and stay a weekend at our cost? We, you don't have to pay to be with us. Bring your family in and before you start working with us so that you get a feel of the hotel, okay? Not everybody's gonna know you're gonna be a new employer or anything. It's your chance to kind of shop us, look around, see 
your fellow soon to be fellow co-workers see what the hotel is like from the consumer side i loved bringing in people especially where they had less hotel experience because they had a more true perspective of how the hotel looked from a consumer rather than tainted from being in the industry for a number of years and making built-in excuses of why things ran the way they did they didn't have that they didn't have that depth of, of experience with hotels so they saw it true to customers perspective Anyway, I would ask them to come in and do that. So they feel first off like, wow, we've got a free weekend. We get to go into the hotel. This is great. And I don't care how nice of a resort I had. Every team member that was brought on board went through this process. There was also a goal orientation that the house, the housekeeper, the HR person to bond with the team member I had them go through where listening to what it is, why they wanted the job, why they got the job, what they wanted to see from it. And a lot of it was cotton candy stuff. People were always, they wanted to put their best foot forward and HR want to put their best foot forward, but that's what it was for. A chance for us to understand what they came in the door before they had the chance to work with us, what they were hoping and looking forward to. We used that in future tense. We used that as a benchmark for how we were treating them. The next was, is that orientation. We actually aggregated orientation for new hires. We didn't pick them up and say, okay, you're hired today, be here tomorrow. We started them as soon as we came, but we we're always doing orientation, but the orientation was the same for everyone. As I mentioned, whether you're a line position or you were an exec committee, you showed up for orientation. You were brought to the best, nicest boardroom we had available for the day of orientation. We brought in breakfast. We brought in lunch. We brought in dinner. And we went through everything. Organizational structure. Who is who? We brought in every department head, regardless of the people that were being oriented and what department they would be in. Every department head came in and introduced themselves and discussed what their role was and what they did. And the general manager was constantly in and out of that in that, that uh, onboarding process, the orientation process. So they felt connected to everybody in the hotel. So I was constantly in there asking questions. Well, what did you think about that? We had videos that we put together explaining processes, explaining the company that we were a part of, that we worked for, that paid our checks, and their management process, their history. So they felt like there was like some depth to who they were working for rather than just somebody sat in an office they never walked in and said hi to. We talked about our programs like NETMA, which was never, and nobody ever tells me anything, which was our always 8 a.m. Um, some people call it an alley rally or whatever, but every department had to represent itself, preferably not the manager of that department, to be honest with you, for the day, but anybody. And their responsibility was to hear what was going on that day and bring it back to their department to let them know, you know we have this many departures, these many arrivals, the engineering is doing this, the front desk is doing this, right? You know, so everyone felt they were a part of what was going on that day. We went constantly, after the orientation, we would then go through a shadow program. And it wasn't a shadow program just for their role. It was a shadow program for every department. I don't care if you're a housekeeper, you ghosted front desk, you ghosted sales, you ghosted food and beverage because you needed to realize you were part of a larger organization. You know you weren't going to serve food, but see what it is for them to do that, to know why when you catch a server in the back of the house and you think you're asking him a question that's not a big deal, that you remember the fact that it's in the middle of lunch rush, he only came back or she only came back to pick up a stack of something, and you're asking something, them something that, honestly, they have no time for, that you don't think it is a rude for them to say, guy, I can't get to you, I'll be back. Realize that there's a reality to their world that is not... Uh, that is not as familiar to yours. This feeling of com community, of connectivity went a long way. And then going back to when they first sat down with HR about why they took the role and what they were expecting from it, that was our first conversation after no more than a week, it was somewhere in between a few days and a week, where the supervisor of that person and the general manager and the HR person, not to gang up on them, but to feel like we're all listening would go and listen to their feedback. We wanted to hear what they saw in reality versus what we said was the case. We wanted to know the variance between what we were projecting they were joining to the reality of what they joined. Because as much as you think the world works the way it does, it doesn't work that way for everybody from the perspective that they have. You say you're being inclusive and part of it, but in all honesty, this is what's happening. That engagement not only improved our ability to know what to do next and what to act on, but it also made the team member, the new team member, feel like they were being listened to. That camaraderie, all of this of what I'm talking about is firsthand for me what I used to do. But also, it's a sense of what doesn't get conveyed in the HR marketing process. This doesn't get talked about. How much of a difference would an interview or information about a position 
be perceived differently if, in fact, this amount of information was presented in the description of the, of the role, where you get to say, look, you are part of a team. Once decided upon that you are to join our team, we're going to ask you to stay at our hotel for a couple of days so you have an unbiased perspective from a guest perspective, what the hotel is. We're going to do an orientation, which you're going to meet and greet all of the department heads and listening and understand what everybody's role is. You're going to be treated equally to anyone else that has that, that we feel has the privilege of joining our team. Um, you're going to be listened to. You're going to be evaluated. We're going to be evaluated by you. Um, you're going to go over and shadow other departments so that you understand your piece to the puzzle to everyone's role that they have. You're going to be given opportunities as much as you want as to where you want and what you want to do when you qualify for being under consideration for those roles. You're going to be acknowledged for what you do. I was a big person about non-annual reviews. And as many companies I worked with, with annual reviews, I hated them, but I did a progressive review up to the annual review. I followed the, I followed the letter of the law, but not its intent. I gave the annual review, but it was based on a perpetual performance review over the course of the whole year because I felt it was so unfair to do an annual review. You're not paying attention in the review mindset of a team member. And for 11 and a half months, they're stellar. And then something happens and it's in the front of your mind at the time you're doing the review and you reflect a, a, on the review way more proportionally than it should be because it's more front of mind and more recent. Yet you ignore the 11 and a half months of success that they had is how I looked at it. So to me, I had a progressive review system. I did very short-term rewards. I acknowledged people quickly and readily. I had a great little fun thing I did pins for. Um, whenever you had, there was five pins you could get. Whenever you achieved all five pins, you got one cluster pin you got to wear, and it was a badge of honor. You got to carry all the pins you earned until you got that cluster, but you could tell, any staff member, any guest could tell that we were dedicated to the engagement of our, of our team members, to the clients, or to the guests because there would be pins of, of whether a guest acknowledged them in a review, whether a, a team member acknowledged them in a review, if they did an exceptional service aspect outside of their department. We had great little recognitions that they got to wear, and that made it a conversation point that when the guest was, so what's that little pin? Oh, well, that was because I, was, I did something. That I go, oh, wow. You know, that made the guests feel really good. They were part of, uh, of staying in a hotel that everybody wanted to be good at. Um, but Conveying this in your job placements is crucial now. This is marketing. It's not just putting it into the roles of on the Indeeds and on the, the uh, zip recruiters and so forth. You can add this type of content in there in your descriptions. You can talk about the culture they're joining. You can talk about the investment you put into them should they accept the role, be qualified to be offered the role. You show that this is worth it. Yeah, our pay is probably the same as somebody else's. Yeah, our hours are probably the same as somebody else's. Yeah, our role is probably the same as somebody else's. But what makes us different is this. And this part, that description isn't getting in front of everybody looking for the roles. And it's not on the platforms that they're using. Now, to, add, to wrap up our final few minutes of our discussion on this, there are things that an HR person being responsible to find the best candidates, being given the description from their supervisors and department that they should be looking for. They're only a conduit at the end. They need to be able to convey two ways, convey what's being requested and convey what they found to those that are requesting it. So they have to understand in a much more dynamic way, the discussion from the food and beverage director and the chef in this case, what they feel they would like to have. We want to calm as, you know, do we want somebody as calm as oil on water? No matter how busy and jam slam we get, that position, that role on the line is one of, I know I'm backed up and I got 40 orders in the, in the queue. I'm good. I'm, I'm moving and shaking. I'm not flaked out, thrown out, crazy, yelling, screaming, whatever. If that's a requirement that they, or a preference they would prefer for the role, that needs to get invaded to HR. So in their interview process with candidates, they can see the temperament of the candidate and say, well, we're really looking for somebody that can handle stress, that really can just buckle in and realize that as busy as it is, it's only going to get done as fast as I can do it. And I'm really fast and leave it at that. Or somebody's like, well, I don't like stress. I, I don't go, you know, I, I can do prep and set up. I can, I can plate up 500 plates, but I can't slam out 10 quick orders. That's the difference. It needs to be understood. The more detail that the, 
that people looking for the role want, the chef and the food and beverage director in this case, to the HR person, the more the HR person can quantify that in their interview processes and their initial discoveries with these people to convey who they think are the better candidates by ranks. Like, I have three candidates for you. This one really fits the emotional world, but they have lower experience than you were thinking compared to this one, which has greater experience, but they tend to be, you know, like they, they prefer a calmer kitchen or whatever it is, it gives perspective. Keeping in mind, there's legalities to this. You can't say, I want a tall person. I want a short person. I want a round person. I want a skinny person. I want this ethnicity or not this ethnicity. You cannot do that stuff, which is a given. That's not, I'm kind of calling Captain Obvious here on that. But the nuances of fit for culture are critical because the HR person can send down candidates that don't fit the culture that's needed but they fit the qualifications. And that only means that you're setting up a person for failure, not success. Because as good as they might be, they're not going to be good in that environment. It's critical the HR component knows this responsibility they have. But going to the marketing aspect. So now we're saying add this third component of content into your descriptions of your positions. Put that in, put that in means that people have a chance to see what, what you're offering. We do this. We offer this. This is why we're cool and different. This is the things we do for all of our team members compared to somebody else that traditionally is like, this is what I want. This is what I need. There's going to be a world of difference of people's perception of your position versus their position. And then back it up with the reality of doing that stuff, obviously. But now from a marketing perspective, you can push that stuff out all day because you can go and say, look, we're a different place to work. We embrace this this way. You can find PR from this where media people are going, you know, in the job world, there's jobs and then there's places that want you because it's a career or it's a community. And they can feature how you've changed uh, your roles description in a way that is soliciting people's interest looking for that role. There is catalyst and I've had success with this doing this where you've literally changed the perception of your roles. People are eager and asking what roles you have available because they like what you say about what you do. Now, all of a sudden, instead of chasing people down, hoping that you're under consideration for them, now people are chasing you back down because you're the best place to be considered. That's the marketing influence within HR. That's the influence that this type, these types of things can do for you in HR. So combining marketing with HR is about expanding the function of HR to the reality that we have now of pursuing and cultivating and defining excellent candidates that are going to be happy to work with us because we told them what we're wanting to do, showed them what we are, and they can choose us because it fits what they were looking for, especially on the intangibles that we don't get to see as much in time as compared to times past where people are looking for that balance of life, quality of joining a team, feeling like they're listened to, feel like they're contributing to something, have the path of growth that they, that they want, whatever it is, makes it more valuable. So there we have it. My uh, one hour, one topic discussion, which is marketing HR, the new job. It is a critical component, I think, that has to be integrated in with HR. If you have a current marketing department, this discussion has to be created. They have to get into brass tacks of things. We use a platform I use all the time called CVViz, which is an aggregate platform that allows you to disseminate your positions over hundreds of job sites, and you can qualify them. We didn't even get into the skill position, which means when you do solicit people outside of your local market, how do you solicit them? Where do you find them? How do you cultivate them? How do you interview them? How do you share this type of information with them so that they're interested in you? There's a whole other conversation with that as well. We just talked about a basic level, local line position opportunity and the dynamics of how it had been done, the dynamics that it should be done and what you need to add to make it even better and more influential for finding the right candidates for all the roles that you have. So with that, uh, thank you for the privilege of your time. Uh, as always, we are simulcasted on, phew, gosh, um, well, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, um, uh, what else, Twitter. Um, we're on multiple pages and platforms. Uh, we're also on Twitch. We broadcast that in our TV channel, which is a uh, hospitality channel. You can find us on Roku, Apple, Amazon, um, and Google on all of their platforms. You just look for hospitality channel. The show, this show is always on the free side of that. There's a payment gateway for additional content. If you chose that, it's like $4.99 a month. Um, discounted if you want to do lots of months for additional content. But the show, this show is always free. We do recast this show Wednesdays, 11.30 a.m. East um, EU time, uh, London time, and 11.30 a.m. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Sydney time. 
because we have a lot of, like I said, 39 countries. We do translate in 11 languages, and we have over 25,000 people we get to listen to watch us. So thank you very much for that. I will do a, uh, we do our weekly audio podcast as well called the uh, Hospitality Marketing in the Podcast. I will recap a little of our highlighted points from our discussion today, which I always do in the podcast, but we're also, we always focus in also on techniques and tools. Uh, for very specific functions of things when relationship to marketing for hospitality. So hopefully you'll catch us on that. We're on 39 plus podcast platforms for that as well. And you actually can ask your Amazon uh, Alexa, Siri, or Google Assistant to just simply play the Hospitality Marketing Podcast and it'll play the latest episode. So with that, again, uh, my name is Lauren Gray. I thank you for the privilege of your time. Please, if you have any questions, feedback, or uh, things you would like to, or join us on the show if you'd like, you can reach out to me at lauren at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com. So with that, uh, I look forward to our discussion next Friday for show number 349, of which I will be broadcasting out on my email, um, but the topic will be if you wish to join us. So until then, thank you so very much and have a great rest of the day and weekend.